Okay, there seems to be an issue with admitting some people. I don't know. I hope that does is not going to intrude into our lecture because I'm going to share my screen as I usually do. And you will recall that we are completing our discussion on chapter four because that leads logically into our discussion of chapter five. So you will have realized that there, there is without any doubt in South Africa's constitutional system, a close relationship with the legislature, which is discussed in chapter four of the textbook, and the executive discussed in chapter five. So this discussion on the, the delegation of legislative authority to the executive, I'm discussing it here, but it is actually also then confirmed in chapter five again. But it is a good place to start because it shows us how the powers of the legislature are limited and what role the executive plays in actually bringing legislation to life. Now, this little section that we're going to deal with now is actually also mostly relevant for question 1.1 of assignment 2. For those of you who I've noticed are not quite on the right track with that question. So we're starting now with our discussion of when and how the legislature can delegate its legislative power. So automatically, you should instinctively realize that in the ordinary course of events, it is the legislature's role to legislate, and therefore the executive cannot on a wide scale, engage in the legislative process. In particular, as I've said a number of times before, Parliament can never, ever delegate its legislative power to pass a law that amends the Constitution to any other legislature, in other words, not to a provincial or a local legislature, and obviously also cannot then delegate that important power to the executive, because the Constitution itself is the original law. In some countries, they call it the organic law. That shows that it's sort of the, the natural law of the country that is of supreme importance. So given that the Constitution is this original law, any amendments to the Constitution also have to comply strictly with the requirement that only the legislature can actually amend this significant and important law. So that's the first general rule, is that Parliament does have limited power to delegate its legislative powers to other legislatures and to the executive, but never ever when it comes to amending the constitution itself. So the point that I'm making is this, and those of you who are doing administrative law will hopefully by now 
already be familiar with what I'm about to explain. And that is quite simply the following. In terms of the structure of our constitution, we have a legislature composed of the 400 members representing our interests. And therefore, laws generally that are going to be applying throughout the country and which are actual pieces of legislation. So I'm using the word legislation there deliberately so that you can distinguish it from subordinate regulations, which is a different kind of legislation. So when we come to when when it comes to passing an ordinary law that is going to apply to the country as a whole. That is a task that is conferred exclusively on Parliament itself. And we call that the plenary legislative process. So plenary means all 400 members, or of course, as we discussed in last week's lecture, as long as there is a quorum, so sufficient number of members of the legislature, all sitting together in their capacity as members of the legislature, they can pass laws. So actual legislation. But there are times where the legislature is extremely busy. And you will recall from last week's lecture that Schedule 4 and Schedule 5 of the Constitution does in fact allow provincial and even local legislatures to come up with laws that are going to deal with issues that are pertinent to their respective provinces. And that is perfectly acceptable for Parliament then, when there is concurrent competence, so either Parliament or a provincial legislature can pass a law, Parliament is perfectly entitled to say, we are extremely busy. So we are going to delegate, but this is then a lawful delegation, delegate the power to draft a law that deals with particular provincial interests to a particular provincial legislature. And there's nothing wrong with that because we have a modern, sophisticated legislature that is busy. It's busy passing laws. It's busy holding the executive accountable. It's busy interviewing potential members for, as pub, the public protector or the new auditor general or the independent electoral commission. It is doing on-site visits to see that vaccination sites are functioning effectively, for example. So the idea here is we understand that our legislature is busy. So in the ordinary course of events, it is supposed to be passing laws and it does pass laws. But in certain limited circumstances, it can delegate the passing of laws to other legislatures, meaning at the provincial or the local spheres of government. And generally, the Constitution itself will be clear about whether such a delegation is acceptable. And that's why Schedules 4 and 5 of the Constitution tell us quite clearly that it is perfectly permissible for a provincial or a local legislature 
to come up with a law. The distinction, and now I'm coming to administrative law, is what the legislature creates is a law much like our constitution itself in that it is mostly just a skeleton or a framework that does go into some detail about why the law is necessary, what issue it is addressing, and it, to some extent detail about how this issue will now be addressed. But somewhere within that law, there will be a specific provision that will say something like, regulations shall be passed in order to implement this legislation more effectively. So just the very fact that I've used the word implement is where you should realize, okay, implementation of legislation is administrative law. And again, based on that knowledge, who is it? Now I'm sort of trying to draw us back, though, to your understanding of the constitutional framework. Whose responsibility is it to implement legislation? It is the executive branch of the state. Therefore, let us use the scenario from your assignment. The Constitution itself would say, in a case of a natural disaster or a situation prevailing that warrants urgent intervention in order to secure livelihoods, health, well-being, and to you know, confront an issue that is of paramount concern to the state. Then regulations must be adopted in order to give clear, unambiguous guidance as to how we will deal with this threat or this issue. And that is why we have the disaster regulations. And who is it that formulated those regulations, the COVID regulations I'm referring to? It is, in fact, the Minister of Cooperative Governance and traditional affairs is her full title. But the first part is the giveaway. She is the, I'm talking here about Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma, who in her official capacity as the Minister of Cooperative Government, so that indicates to you, she is then doing what is required in terms of chapter three of our constitution to make sure that the national government, the provincial government, and the local government are all fully aware of what is happening and that they, at all three spheres, they are given sufficient powers in terms of a national framework to deal with this existential threat to South Africa being COVID-19. And that's when we saw the regulations stating such things as smoking shall be prohibited and no cigarettes shall be sold, or 
no liquor may be sold or to, to sort of highlight what seems very strange are provisions such as only closed shoes you know closed toe shoes may be sold so the point i'm trying to indicate to you is that those regulations are known as subordinate legislation so that very terminology tells you that it is not of the same or equal status as an ordinary law, but it has a distinct purpose, and that is to ensure that the law, being the constitution, can actually work properly to confront this issue that the government is grappling with. And so it's perfectly in order for a law to state somewhere in it that the minister responsible for that portfolio has the power to draft regulations. So you will have seen it probably in the Medicines Act, where the Medicines Act says regulations must be passed and those regulations then state when you go to a pharmacy the pharmacy may only charge a maximum of one rand fifty as a dispensing fee for example so that amount of money is not something dealt with in the original law because it may change and because Parliament itself may not have the necessary expertise, whereas the Minister of Health can bring together a task team of people to assist him or her to decide on the amount of money that pharmacies can charge. And that's why equally, if it's the Minister of Cooperative Governance who's got to draft regulations about COVID, she is not going to be doing that in isolation, but will most certainly be doing it with the assistance of the Minister of Health, possibly the Minister of Education, the Minister of um, in Industry, what's it, DR, DTR, Department of Trade and Industry, yes. Possibly even... Ministry of Home Affairs because, well, and as you saw, the initial lockdown regulation stated, for example, that no one is allowed, our borders are closed. So, of course, the Department of Home Affairs then has to make sure that, in fact, no one is allowed to leave South Africa or to enter South Africa during that particular time frame. So you notice that those regulations are the actual meat or the substance to make the law be able to be implemented as it was envisaged. You can then see that in certain circumstances, a law can be passed by the executive but it is a specific type of law. It is subordinate legislation, otherwise known as regulations. And so let us then, I've, I know I've dealt with these cases before, but just to you know, reinforce the position. In re very early into our democracy, not even a year in, we already saw the, the problem arise where Parliament sitting in plenary, so all 400 members of South Africa's new first democratic parliament, they decided to create a law called the Local Government Transition Act, as they are entitled, were entitled to do 
But being new members of the legislature and not, not necessarily understanding how constitutional law works precisely, and because we have this decolonized system of separation of powers, our first parliament did make a mistake. The mistake they made is they said in section 16, the president may amend this act. Now, hopefully you will have realized as I said that, that that is unconstitutional because the president is actually head of the executive and the executive's role is not to amend any legislation. The most they can do, as I've just described in the context of regulations, is make subordinate legislation. But they cannot, or, or the, the president cannot, amend an entire law because that's not his job. We know that the legislature's fundamental function is to pass, amend, and repeal legislation. And so when this act was now assented to and came into power, ironically, the president himself signed the law bringing it into power or, or bringing it to life. And then section 16 said the president is also the one who must amend the law when necessary. That was when the Western Cape provincial government realized, but hang on, there is a fundamental problem here. The president is not the right person to ever amend law. And it was in this precise case where the entire discussion that I've just given you about 